Then the defense, which hadn't put up a sack in 12 quarters, finally did. Perhaps the most popular TV hijacking is the Max Headroom incident. It's likely you've seen it before. A man dressed in a suit, sunglasses, and most notably a Max Headroom mask. Max Headroom was a fictional character advertised as the first computer-generated TV presenter. He first appeared in his own movie before the character got his own TV program. Popular back in the mid-80s, it's likely most everyone instantly recognized the mask when on November 22, 1987, a sports segment on WGN-TV was abruptly hijacked. This being what appeared on the screens of thousands. Man and McKinnon, 14 nothing Bears, then the defense, which hadn't put up a sack in 12 quarters, finally did. Hijacking lasted a total of 17 seconds before engineers at WGN were able to regain control of the broadcast tower by switching to a backup frequency. At the time, not even they knew what had happened. Well, if you're wondering what's happened, <laughs> so am I. Actually, the computer that we have running our news from time to time took off and went wild. So what we're going to do is start over from the top of the Bears and tell you once again about the 30 to 10 victory they had over Detroit today out at Soldier Field. We'll show you from the top and show you again. The video itself shows the man in the Max Headroom mask swaying erratically, all while the background rotates from side to side. This is seemingly to recreate the look from the actual Max Headroom show, which features a similar background. During the hijacking, a distorted buzzing sound can be heard. Only the visuals were successfully hijacked. However, on that same day a few hours later, a different station, WTTW, was also hijacked by the same group, and this time there was audio. You should talk often with the old ones of your tribe. That is the only way to learn. I'll get you a hot drink, miss. Oh, I could have some dry clothes. He's a freaking man. I think I'd better check some rice in there. Freaking rough. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. This second incident lasted longer at about 90 seconds. This is because no engineers were on duty at the time, meaning no one was there to quickly switch to a backup frequency. The motive behind the interruption is unknown, as there isn't really ever one clearly established even with audio. Many suggest the man was simply rambling on, saying any nonsense sentence that came to mind. However, others think differently. The man mentions Chuck Swirsky, who was a TV reporter employed by WGN. At one point, the man also begins humming the tune to Clutch Cargo, a cartoon that aired on WGN. He followed this with, I still see the axe. This is possibly a reference to the last episode of Clutch Cargo aired on WGN, titled Big Axe. Additionally, the man mentions how he made a giant masterpiece for all the greatest world newspaper nerds. He likely meant World's Greatest Newspaper, or WGN, the first station that was hijacked. Perhaps he felt wronged by the station in some way, and the hijacking was deliberately created for and against WGN. 
or maybe everything he said was all nonsense. Whatever the case, the FBI immediately started an investigation, confident they would be able to find whoever was responsible for the interference. But the odds, I'd say, if a guy continues to involve himself, either sporadically or continuously, uh, it's very great that we will determine who it is. Months, years, and now even decades have passed with no sign of who's behind the Max Hedrew mask. All we know for sure is what's shown in the video. At least three people were involved, one under the mask, one behind the camera, which can be proven from a slight shift in the camera's angle at one point, and one rotating the background, which is shown stopping when they step in to frame themselves. Also known is that the video was not recorded live, rather it was pre-recorded. This is proven with the visible cut in the video. To this day, it remains unknown who hijacked the two TV stations. No one has ever been charged. On August 19, 1987, during the 4 p.m. edition of KNBC's Channel 4 News, reporter David Horowitz was interrupted by an unidentified man walking into the studio. The man appears in frame armed and hands David a set of papers. He instructs him to read them. And without another option, David calmly does what he's told. Pardon me? What is this? Let me see what it says. All right. He's got a gun to his back. All right, well, let me read this. Folks, we have, we have someone on the set who's standing here and would like me to read, um, to read this, uh, this, this copy which was just handed to me. You want to tell me your name or not? What is it? And Gary, where are you from? The video was then taken off the air and replaced with a still screen, but thousands of people had already witnessed it live and police were immediately flooded with calls from viewers. Monitors in the studio clearly indicated they were no longer on the air, but the reporters desperately tried to convince the man he was still on. He believed them and continued to let David read. I was warned in 1981 by someone with connections at the CIA to stay off the computers, that they didn't trust people on computers. When I began receiving disturbing calls from my parents, which led me to believe that something terrible was going on, I was then forced into a mental hospital in Tallahassee where I learned that my brother-in-law had been driven insane in the, in the same, what is it? In the same manner that someone was trying to do to me. After minutes of this, David finally finishes reading the statement, at which point the man sets down his weapon and it's revealed that it was only ever an empty BB gun. Police entered the studio and immediately arrested the guy. He was Gary Stolman. He managed to get in the studio as a guest to an employee. His father, Max Stolman, would sometimes work for KNBC as a reporter. Once inside, Gary waited for the channel to go live before walking into frame. Now, written on the paper Gary wanted read, it turned out to be a nonsense statement on the CIA, alien life, and other conspiracy type stuff. One of the sections read, The man who has appeared on KNBC for the past three years is not my biological father. He is a clone, a double created by the Central Intelligence Agency and alien forces. It is only a small part of a greater plot to overthrow the United States government and possibly the human race itself. Gary was sent to a county jail as he awaited trial. He was found mentally ill and was arranged to get the help he needed. His father later made a statement on the incident, reading, I do have a sick son. He has been hospitalized a number of times. I'm just thankful he wasn't shot. In July of 2007, WJLA, a TV station in Washington, D.C., was abruptly interrupted from its regular programming. Everything was going as usual, when all of a sudden the screen went black, and without warning, this image appeared on viewers' TVs. A close-up, grainy, black-and-white photo of two human heads, one smiling, one not. Viewers watching live were confused and honestly creeped out. The image was unsettling to say the least. It stayed on screen for several seconds with no movement and no sound, just the image, before abruptly disappearing and returning to the station's regular programming. Many viewers called the station and made posts online trying to get answers. In response, the cable company ended up releasing an official statement on the incident. 
They claimed the image was a still frame from an advertisement for the Oprah Winfrey show that was scheduled to play later on. Basically, they reasoned that their system somehow glitched in showing the still frame. This explanation left people skeptical. Many searched but found no Oprah Winfrey advertisement showing anything resembling the still frame. It's widely believed the explanation was a cover-up for a successful hijacking of the station. Although, if this is the case, whoever's responsible for it is not identified. Viewers that had footage of the incident found that after posting them online, they were mysteriously getting taken down. There are no surviving videos left on the internet today, and so footage of the incident is now being treated as lost media. The only remaining evidence is this picture of the still frame that was shown. It's January 3rd, 2007. The Australian broadcast channel Channel 7 is broadcasting a rerun of an episode of the Canadian television documentary Mayday. At one point during the documentary, the audio suddenly cuts out and is eerily replaced with constant looping of a man yelling the words, Jesus Christ, help us all, Lord. The visuals remain unchanged. It was only the audio that was affected. One viewer witnessing this pulled out his camera and began recording the strange audio. This would go on for over five minutes before returning back to the documentary's original sound. The viewer wrote, I was channel surfing and heard this weird sound being repeated. It caught my attention as it was very odd, a bit creepy. I thought it was some kind of subliminal message or that someone must have hacked in. I tried ringing the station for several minutes, but they never picked up. After gathering enough attention, a spokesperson for the network would make a statement. He denied the transmission being a prank or security breach, and actually claimed that the repeated line was a part of the original broadcast. He further stated that the audio actually said, Jesus Christ, one of the Nazarenes. However, there's almost no similarity between the two phrases. People took this statement almost as a joke, considering how absurd it was. It's believed the station's audio was temporarily hijacked and the network didn't want to admit to it. A few independent researchers began an investigation on where the original audio came from, and surprisingly, it was actually found. It turns out the audio came from the haunting video of Preston Wheeler reacting to an ambush on his convoy in Iraq. Jesus Christ, help us all, Lord. This attack occurred after the convoy had made a wrong turn down a dead-end street. Though, Preston was fortunate enough to make it out alive. The finding of this video seemed to raise only more questions, like the reason behind why the hijacker chose to use this audio. No further information would ever be discovered. The whole situation kind of just slowly died down with no real answers. The hijacker responsible was never identified. <laughs> 